We'll talk about some of my case reports. And I told you about this lady from Fox Chase Cancer Center uh, four years ago. She was uh, a smoker, diagnosed with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer to liver and spine. She completed two rounds of carboplatin, taxol and avastin prior to my protocol. Her initial CEA, carcinoembryonic antigen, was 800. She had two rounds of chemotherapy, and her CEA went to 2,240. Now, sometimes, and you need to expect this, sometimes when you give chemotherapy, if it's working, the tumor marker will come down. But sometimes you get a bunch of cell kill, and the tumor marker goes up, and then it goes down. But when you see two or more consecutive increases in tumor marker, that's a pretty good sign that the chemotherapy is not working. So that's when this lady decided to come down. And after two weeks of doing the protocol, her CEA went to 1,036. Um, six months after initiation of the, I say antioxidant, that's a bad word. That's not what it is. Uh, there was no evidence of cancer by CT or PET scan. She ended up terminating the protocol because of lack of funds, even though her CEA was 30. Uh, normal in a non-smoker uh, is about 2.5, in a smoker less than 5. I told her, you know what, your CEA is still elevated, but she, you know, she didn't have the funds. Uh, 16 months later, she did have recurrence to lung and liver, and she has been sporadically using both chemotherapy and high-dose vitamin C um, in Philadelphia, and as of March of 2009, stable disease. Um, so she has beat the odds big time. Here was a young lady, 40-year-old female diagnosed with right breast cancer with several positive nodes. Um, she was triple negative, estrogen receptor negative, progesterone receptor negative, HER2 new negative in 2001. Um, lumpectomy, radiation, chemotherapy. In 2004, she had a, she fa they found a, a large right neck mass, and it was metastatic disease. She resumed chemotherapy. 2005, she had a left lung mass. She went multiple rounds of chemotherapy. October 2006, the CAT scan revealed multiple masses and nodules in both lungs, mediastinum, with compression of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, so she had a hoarse voice. December 2006, she began my protocol along with chemotherapy. January 2007, once again, I told you often not having a lot of luck with chemotherapy and the protocol. CT revealed progression of the disease with increasing size of bilateral lung masses and multiple new nodules. February 2007, she decided to stop the chemotherapy because she was getting sick and it wasn't working. She continued my protocol. In April of 2007, it's the first time she's had stable disease with the left lung mass decreasing in size by one-third. And she resumed exercising, and her hoarse voice had resolved because that mass came off the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Now, this is certainly still very late in the presentation. In April 2007, she started altering the protocol, secondary to in, uh, insufficient funds, decreasing the number of visits, July 2007, chest CT revealed progression of lung mets, and then at the end of July uh, uh, 2007, she died. These are always very hard. It's very hard dealing with young people, you know, and, and as you'll, you'll, you may see as well. Um, right now, uh, I deal with every patient. Every patient is my mother. Every patient is, you know, is my dad, my brother, and it's, it's heart-wrenching. It's very hard. And they're going to look at you as their savior. It's really, really tough. But it's, you know, with all the bad times, it's worth it because you truly can, can make a difference in, in helping people live longer and better. This is a 73-year-old gentleman diagnosed with stage 3C colon cancer in 2004, was through the wall of the colon and had greater than four nodes involved. He had a resection in chemotherapy. 2006, he had recurrence in the liver. He went out to Arizona, was treated with IV vitamin C, and he had progression of the liver, of, of liver mass, just progressed. Vitamin C wasn't working. February 2007, he began my protocol. 
In August of 2007, the PET scan revealed no progression of disease. Uh, he had been on oral medicines, uh, let's see, he had been on oral medicines only, no infusion since November, tumor marker unchanged, and patient is, was asymptomatic. Now let me, let me go a little further than this. He subsequently passed away, and I'm going to tell you about our role as an integrative cancer therapy physician is to know everything to treat the cancer. Um, it started progressing, and his disease was isolated to his liver. So what I decided to do is how do you just treat the liver? It was involving too many lobes, so we couldn't do a liver resection. So there's something called microspheres or therospheres, which is yttrium-90, radioactive yttrium-90, um, using nanospheres. And what you do is you cannulate the hepatic artery, and then you, you clamp off the hepatic vein, and you can go right in the hepatic artery with these nanospheres in yttrium-90. And you can literally just wipe out, if it's confined to the liver, you can wipe out all the cancer. So, of course, he said, why, why didn't my oncologist tell me this? And the truth is, because the oncologist gives chemotherapy and he doesn't know. And that's our role. We need to know everything to do. You know, you have isolated disease to the liver. Let's see if we can take care of it. So, in fact, what we did is we had given him, we did this, and he was disease-free for almost a year. I mean, no cancer, and he stopped seeing me, nothing at all. Uh, it's interventional radiology. So he went to Memorial Hospital, um, Hollywood Memorial Hospital in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and uh, I discussed the case with the interventional radiologist. He said, no problem, and, um, and the, the guy, resumed traveling. Uh, he, he loves to go to uh, Central and South America. And then after a year, it came back, actually presented. It came back with a spot on the liver and on the right hemidiaphragm, and he presented with hiccups, hiccuping. And um, what ended up happening is it ended up communicating with the skin, so he had some drainage. And I said, okay, we've got to begin our protocol again, IVs and all the whole deal. And he said, no, I'm done. I'm done. And, uh, and, you know, they get to make that decision. And um, within a few months, I mean, he went very quickly. But it is our job to know everything you can do. And that's, I mean, I'm constantly going back to the literature. How else can I approach this? How else, what else can we do? And that's what we're going to do differently than the oncologist, because their armamentarium is chemotherapy. Okay. Okay, this is a 52-year-old lady diagnosed with metastatic pancreatic cancer to liver in January 2007. Her 54-year-old sister died two years earlier of the same disease. And her sister died six months after diagnosis. June 6, 2007, her CA-199 was 13,787. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm reflecting back. I'm going through each patient uh, as I read. And, um, and I remember she was, yeah, she was diagnosed January 2007. After her sister died, um, a couple of months after her sister died, she went to her um, primary physician and said, you know, I want to make sure I don't have pancreatic cancer. I know I don't have any problems, but my sister died of pancreatic cancer. And so I still have the ultrasound report. The ultrasound editor, and what they said is um, um, unusually enlarged pancreas, um, further studies indicated. He said, ah, it's nothing. Come on, I told you it's nothing. And then, finally, several months later, she had abdominal pain, and they did a CAT scan, and then it was in the liver. 